Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Lions Life Coaching, the podcast where extraordinary stories of resilience and transformation ignite your spirit and set your motivation ablaze. I'm Cody, and today we're diving into a tale that redefines the boundaries of human strength and determination. In the spotlight today is a man who's not just faced adversity, but has risen from its ashes like a mythical phoenix. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm thrilled to introduce David, the mastermind behind Phoenix Fitness and the driving force behind the viral sensation Fit Men Over 40 on TikTok. Once a healthcare CEO in a high-stakes corporate world, David's life took an unimaginable turn. Faced with with a life-threatening brain tumor that led to a stroke, he found himself battling partial paralysis and an uncertain future. But where many saw an end, David saw a new beginning. With unwavering determination and a spirit that refused to be extinguished, David not only reclaimed his health, but also redefined his purpose. He left the security of his executive role to embark on a mission fueled by passion and empathy. Phoenix Fitness isn't just a brand, it's a testament to the indomitable human spirit, a beacon of hope for those who think their best days are behind them. And from the men over 40 who thought age was a barrier to fitness, David's viral TikTok presence under Fit Men Men Over 40 stands a powerful counter-argument. He's not just transforming bodies, he's revolutionizing mindsets. So buckle up, listeners, as we dive into the inspiring journey of a man who turned a personal tragedy into a triumphant quest to empower others. David, welcome to Lions Life Coaching. Thank you. Is, is there anything you'd like to uh, tell us about yourself or, or about your journey before uh, we, we got some questions asked? Um, uh, basically, I'm, I'm, I'm 54. Uh, I've been fit all my life. But um, I think it's it's just through uh, you know since I had the stroke that I I really decided to uh, embark on my fitness journey. Can Can you tell us a little bit more about what you were doing before? I was a healthcare CEO. Work I worked for a, a company that helped for about fifteen years. I worked at a company that helped people mental issues as well as uh, substance abuse issues awesome you were, you were already making a difference even before even before training it sounds like yeah and i think before that for about 10 or so years i worked for a company that that worked with individuals uh with uh developmental disabilities wow that's awesome so i i think my my background working with all these these different uh uh People really gave me a good understanding of many of the difficulties that people had to uh, persevere through. It sounds like it. I, I mean, <clears throat> mental health is one of our our, our big uh, tenants here. We, I, as I kind of you know briefly alluded before we before we schedule this, we we kind of do two separate types of episodes. One is mental health and and rebuilding, just like nobody excuse me nobody really tells you how to do that and so so we were kind of trying to start that at least to the point that some people are able to have some type of a roadmap there's it's it's not laid out there for you uh you kind of got parts of it you have to figure out yourself but you know there there are some things you got to do and not gonna kind of stop doing in order to get there exactly i i think um the stroke really it really you really when you're struck down with, with basically being at rock bottom, uh, you really, it really taxes your mental health. Right. You, I, I mean, I really can't imagine like, you know, going from in, in your own head, being somebody that lots of people look up to and rely on. And then now you're kind of have to, ha- having to collect yourself. It's difficult. I think right when it happened, it, I had double vision, for example. I couldn't drive for six <clears throat> for a period of about six months. Um, it was it was kind of scary because I didn't think I was going to get my vision back and be able to drive again. Mm. That's that's I I can't imagine. That's rough. But so basically, what happens when when you have something like a stroke is for for about. The first six months, you get the most recovery. Then after that, you really got to roll up your sleeves and put in some work to get any right. kind of growth. Because after six <clears throat> after six months, your body starts to just acclimate to where you were before, and that's about it. So you have about that magic window of six months 
then after six months, kind of, you've got to work probably, uh, it's not even like twice as hard. It's like probably a, a thousand times as hard. It's difficult. Well, I mean, you're a living testament that it, it can be done with enough willpower. That's incredible. I, I think it's all about willpower and you know, it's a combination, I'll be honest, it's a combination of, of doing the physical work as well as, as the mental. Right. Deciding to quit at any point in time, like, you know, again, who would blame you? That's, that, that's a lot to go through for anybody at any age. I'm, I'm not going to lie and say there weren't moments that, that I didn't feel like quitting, but you know, you just can't, you've got to just mm -hmm. dig deep within yourself. And I think one of the big things is, is you have to almost hit like a rock bottom where you just pick yourself up. And really at the end of the day, it's, it's really you versus you. I mean, you have to save yourself. And if you do quit, you still wake up tomorrow. Oh, you still. Exactly. You still have the same issues. And really, I think that the, you know, the turning point for me was realizing the fact that um, I could, could uh, be angry as much as I wanted to, but the issue was still going to be there. Uh, and, and am I gonna, just going to leave it here or am I going to do something about it? Right. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. uh, oh, sorry, Ashley. Why, why sit there and dwell on something instead of actually making a difference and doing something to change it and make it better? 100% correct. And that that's kind of an attitude I, I, I've taken since then that any obstacle that I face, it's just like, you know, I can be mad about it or, or you know just get upset or i could actually do something about it right. getting mad about it doesn't accomplish anything it's it's, it's done that's a, the uh the attitude that i have it's done this is what i have to face how am i going to deal with it how, how are you going to get back into things and and keep keep moving exactly well <clears throat> So I know you were a healthcare CEO. What were what were some of the challenges that you faced then when you were because that's not that that's not an easy job. You no, know, I'm, I'm not gonna. Yeah, when when I came back to work, it was difficult because I I still had I was driven to work, um, and it was even doing my job was so much more difficult. I double vision for the first six months. I couldn't even see the computer screen really. Right. It was what? it was difficult. So. So I really had to, uh, that's the biggest thing I think with, with how I did my job and even the, the uh, physical movements that I did to get my body back. You've got to just, if you're used to doing it one way, you've got to create a new way to do it. So for mm. example, with my balance issues, when I first had the stroke, I couldn't do like, for example, a regular squat. So what I did was I did a, you know, uh, like more of a Smith machine squat. So anything that you do it doesn't matter if you're doing weights or you're doing your physical job you've got to modify what you're doing and that's one of the biggest things i think i, I got from this ex experience was the fact that you know there's more than one way of doing something and right even if you've got to modify you know you've got to hold on to the bar when you're doing a squat or you've got to modify a bench press or something else you know some aspect of your job you've got to just be creative with i can't do it the way i used to how am i going to do it now what what were some of the the achievements that you experienced when can, can you just kind of give us like a brief timeline of of you were you were the healthcare ceo for for how, how many years before, before uh, this happened it was about 15 years and then and and then the incident happened. You said you were you were there for six months after that, and then decided this this wasn't what you wanted to do anymore. Exactly. Gotcha. Well, that's a lot of time to think. And you know, if I don't know, but you know, if, if that wasn't what you wanted to be doing, you you had a period of time to think about it and decide what do I really want to do. Exactly. I just felt like it wasn't. I was at a point in my life I wasn't really. Um, Abraham Maslow called it the accusation, uh, self-accusation, the highest form of, of, you know, where you're supposed to reach in life. I felt like right. it wasn't, I wasn't reaching my full. Well, I, I, 
I don't know the kind of difference you could have made in that role uh, uh, by by doing that job, yay or nay. But I know, like, I know for a fact, personal trainers make a huge difference in in the lives. Just whether it's by their story or just like like you said, learning a different way and like having alternating exercises for for things that like people otherwise would not be able to do. Exactly, and I think that's one of the things that I I, I help bring to to the job. I I help people realize that you know there's more than one way of doing something unfortunately right. i think if you look um you know on on different uh platforms that are out there there's all these trainers that just like they're like one trick ponies they're you know there's only one way of doing something and you you've got to do keto or carnivore or, or mediterranean or all these different diets or there's only one way of doing certain types of to build chest, you got to do this. If you want abs, you got to do this. It's all a bunch of nonsense. At the end of the day, there's so many different ways to get abs. There's so many different ways to, mm. to get to your dream body. There's so many different ways to get that chest you want. You know, right. it, that's one of the things that, that I think that, that this, you know, the stroke really caused me to realize is there's more than one way of doing something. And it might not be the most efficient, but it gets you to the same point. Right. And if that's all you have, that's that's good enough. That's it, if it's getting you there, that's what matters. It like exactly. we were earlier. It's a journey, and I, I think it's a journey with yourself. It's not about you comparing yourself to other people. It's about it's you versus you. I I agree one hundred percent. Ashley, do you want to get the, the next question? Okay. How do you think your experience has shaped your approach to fitness and personal training? I think, <clears throat> pardon me, I think my experience has, has really um, helped me to realize, I mentioned a moment ago, there's more than one way of doing something. And really, it's given me more of a perspective that, you know, I've become more of, of, a, of a client first. So as a client, I realize what I need as far as, you know, how to imp make improvements and what I can do and what I can't do, what, what my limitations are. So I think it's given me a different perspective of the whole situation rather than being before, um, you know, in the past, you know, I think I would have had more of a mindset of, you know, why can't you do this or this is easy or you know, I can get abs, or I can get this, or I can do that. Diving is easy, or this is easy. But I think with having the stroke and having the limitations that I did, it made me realize that these these people that I'm I'm dealing with have just as many, if not more, issues than I do. They have just as, as many uh, limiting beliefs as I do. They have just as many struggles. So it's made me more empathetic, I think. That definitely makes sense. I think that, uh, in my opinion, everything happens for a reason. And I mean, I know that you went through a hard time, but I feel like it helped you get to where you are now. And I hope that it's a happier place for you. Oh, I thank you for saying that. I think you're 100% correct. Everything does happen for a reason. And at the end of the day, I'm a stronger person now than I was when this happened, you know, I think that uh, we all tend to, tend to take things for, for granted. I was no different, even seeing or walking or talking. Let's be honest, we all take it for granted. And we all worry about, oh, I just got this cup of coffee and they screwed up the order or, or this happened or that happened or this, this is, you know, and at the end of the day, that's all stupid stuff. You worry about the little stuff, and then we take things so much for granted. And it's not till it's not till you lose your sight or your vision or your ability to walk or talk that you really realize the important things in life. And I think it, it helped me with a perspective as a trainer to realize at the end of the day, health equals wealth. The most important thing you could have all the money in the world that you want. If you don't have good health, you can't enjoy it. You can't do any of the things. You can't do anything. It. No, yeah. you can't. 
both mental and physical yes you're 100 percent correct i'm glad you brought the men mental part because too often uh, i think as you mentioned before people don't really take into account the importance of good mental health they what really don't do yeah That's... you need to not only work like you said on your body but you need to work on your mind your soul you need to have all of it <clears throat> that's why I think in the upcoming year, I'm looking more towards more of a, a holistic mind, body, spirit kind of training. That's great. I think this is going to be a, a better year for everyone. I think every, <clears throat> at, at least for the most, the majority of the folks that I've talked to over the past maybe two years, everybody's can, been having kind of a hard time of it. it. It's just been a rough period. Just it's, it's been, been a real rough period. COVID. Exactly. I think COVID really hit a lot of people very hard with their mental health. Yes. Yeah, that was, yeah, I, I know I was not, I, I was not cut out for it even at the time. And I'm, I'm kind of a homebody. I work from home. The only time I really go anywhere is groceries and the gym. That's and I, that was... I feel worse for the, the kids uh, that had to go to school at the time because it, it's yeah. just, it, it's got to be so difficult. We have a trainer that his senior year was in during COVID. And, you know, that's yeah. the, that's the time that you look up to and you're like, it's going to, you know, even if you had kind of like crappy high school experience, your senior year is going to like, at least some of that's going to pay off. Exactly. And so... All right. So uh, what was your lifestyle like during your tenure as a CEO and how did it contribute to your health journey? Um, I was very active. I had, a, as a CEO, I had a very hands-on approach with both my staff and the clients that I served. I think after I had my stroke, I wasn't able to do quite as much as I used to. It was harder for me to, to do what I did before. But I still, I still made an, an effort to really uh, do as much as I could. And did when you came back, and if this is you know, you know, too into it, just let me know, and then I'm, I'll move to the next question. But was it just like this? This, this isn't what I want anymore, or was it more like this is <clears throat> this is a lot more than I more involved and difficult than I remember it being? Or some combination of it. I think I, I could do the job physically and mentally. I think it was more, I just wasn't satisfied. I felt like I, I wasn't serving my purpose at that point. I felt oh, like yeah. there was more to do. I felt the mm -hmm. call to do more and to help people. Yeah. I think there's things that happen in our life that really... We if we have a few, uh, two choices. We can either follow one path or another path. When I I I thought this was a, a, a opportunity for me to just follow a different path, right? Because the path <clears throat> the path that I was following was no longer serving serving me uh, mentally anymore. I'm glad that you recognize that because I it at <clears throat> any point before then did you feel like you you kind of like Maybe, maybe there was a less strong call to be a trainer to do the kind of work you're doing now. I didn't really. I've, I've always been interested in being a, a trainer. I'm not gonna lie, and I thought that maybe I would do it as a side hustle. But it was just something that I think we all need things in our life to, to kind of give us a nudge sometimes. And I think. I think initially I was going to just keep my, my day job, so to speak, and do the, the training as a side hustle. Then the stroke happened, and it was like, why wait? Just do it. Right. Life's too that, short. Hold back. Life's too short. That's upside. That, that's great to hear that that's the direction you took it, because a lot of people, maybe even just for fear of trying something new and failing, right. might, might not have done it. Yeah, I mean, I think I reached a point where when you hit when you hit a point where you're so low and almost rock bottom, you're just like, I've got nothing else to lose. The only thing I can do is is rise up from here, and that's always been my 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 
my attitude that once you get to rock bottom, that's what I don't understand when, when, when people say, well, you have to hit rock bottom. Some people hit rock bottom and they never rise up, but there are others that reach rock bottom and they're like, I'm not going any lower and I'm going to rise up. And that was my attitude. This shows your character and what kind of person you are. And unfortunately, you, you see people, and I used to see it um, <clears throat> in in the health, health field with dealing with people who had uh, drug issues, that some of these people, they would hit rock bottom, but they could never lift themselves up. And I always used to, used to scratch my head and think, why can't you do it? You know, and I think, I think the stroke really gave, I really had to put up or shut up with the stroke because I always talk to talk, but now I had to actually walk the walk. Right. Okay. You, you bring that up, but I, and sorry, I agree with your actions. Like I, I feel the same way, but you did that. You, you, like you did talk to talk and, and now you are walking the walk. Like that's, that's not that that's not common enough like that that's that's extraordinary really like <clears throat> and, and it's like we we talked about a, a lot about substance abuse uh in, in the past on the show that mainly primarily that like the u.s doesn't treat it correctly it's it's kind of more of like a mental health issue versus a criminal issue and they don't really do enough for that uh here in the united states uh but yes. it's <sighs> Like, like, even if, you, if the folks stop using the drugs, that doesn't, that doesn't give them the purpose. Kind of, kind of, you know, like that doesn't fix that. That was one of their problems. That are the rest of their problems. Exactly, and it's just so. For example, we would have people on certain that would use certain drugs, and they would be given yet another drug like Suboxone, and and it's just like to me, you've got to just do one or the, you've got to just do cold turkey and that's one of the things at least for myself i'm not trying to judge but for myself i've always been been someone who just if i say i'm going to do something i do it and you know i don't care like a cold plunge you know i'm not the type that's going to dip my my foot in the water i'm just going to jump in yeah <laughs> just jump in and and just deal with it but Never. what what i've realized uh, over time is everyone's not wired like that and That's i the, think i i think one of the things i've had to do as a coach and i'm not gonna lie is sometimes i have to take a, a few steps back because i have my way of doing something but everyone doesn't have their way of doing something and sometimes i've had to hold people a little bit more by the hand where i'd be the type that would more just do it and not complain everyone's not like that no right well there's just give him there's a lot to be said for self motivation yeah. that's exactly yeah sorry i didn't mean what, what was... no i'm sorry what i found is either people have it or they don't and one of my things you know i have a background in, in teaching too in college and one of the things that um, you know, I studied for business and I studied for teaching as well. One thing that I, I that was when I was, I'm able with my coaching to utilize my teaching background that I feel like <clears throat> some people, it's not just about teaching them exercises or diets or whatever. It's about teaching them life experiences and how to handle things and mental, uh, you know, things that they can focus on. So there's always that teaching aspect in coaching that I think too often people put aside. There's teaching, there's motivation, there's so many different things that coaches do. And right. some explain like willpower is kind of like a muscle. Like if you don't have a lot of willpower at first, you have uh, your, for diet, for instance, mine, mine was uh, like getting up really early uh, we get up around four o'clock and go straight to the gym until i started trying to get up that early and i was in the military for years like 
getting up sure. early should be no big deal. Like, but when I, when I started doing it, like I would get up at 4 a.m. like a couple of days out of the week. And then the rest of them, I'd like, you know, hit my alarm and I have my alarm like in the bathroom on the counter so that I have to get up and go turn it off on my phone. And sure. I did start getting up at six o'clock, start getting up at five o'clock, start getting up at four o'clock. And then that's, mm -hmm. and, and I didn't really realize it, it is kind of like a muscle. You do kind of have to exercise it and work your way up to it. You know, sometimes that's, it's before that I was like, well, I'll just, I'll just get up at four and start doing that. And I was running so ragged because I was working so much and uh, we, while we were doing the other, the other marketing company and it was just exhausting. The whole day was just exhausting, but now it's kind of just become part of the routine. It's part of your routine. And I think an important aspect of the whole thing is the difference between motivation and this uh, discipline. And I think, mm. think that's what you see with the first month or so uh, of the new year with everyone with these New Year's resolutions and they're, they're motivated to exercise and be healthy. But at the end of the day, it comes down to uh, discipline. And I think that you see people, you know, more than a couple months at the gym, they've developed discipline. And, you know, yes. this motivation is just going to get you to the gym maybe for the first couple of weeks, a month, maybe two months, yes. if that. But then it's that's why you see the gym the first month of the year. It's packed. Mm -hmm. And then go go the second month, the third month, and it's just, it's it's quiet. Yep. Back to the same regulars that were there. In same November. regulars, exactly. Because people, people don't realize that they've got to develop discipline. And really what you need is at least 21 days, experts say, to really get that discipline started. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Give yourself a fighting chance. Exactly. So I actually want to ask the next question. Let's get in there. With the diagnosis of a brain tumor and subsequent stroke, what was the period like for you? emotionally and physically? I think it was probably, uh, I would have to say, the darkest point in my life. I mean, you know, you just, you do the things that you used to be able to do. You, I, My vision was was terrible, wasn't able to walk like I used to. Like used to. Um, I couldn't really talk. I was, you know, I don't think I speak great now, but I, uh, my, my, my much worse. Uh, when this first happened and I think it was, it was dark and I just reached a point where I just said this is either going to be my life or I can take back my life and give it a hundred percent and you know die trying and that I think that always been my attitude that I've got to roll up my sleeves and deal with with things and not not be a victim and I think that's too often it's easy it's to get in that victim mindset that why me and poor me and blah, blah, blah. And at the end of the day, it happened. You know, life sometimes isn't always fair and you've got to deal with it. There's, this is my life. This is my lot in life. And I look around and there's so many people with, that are dealing with far worse than me. And, and they've come to watch. I used to look on videos online sometimes, and I used to see people sometimes missing limbs of their body or people that came back from the military with all these TBIs and all these other, other things. And it's just like, these people have far worse than what I have, and they're, they're overcoming what they have. Why can't I? Let me, let me uh, be the same type of person. I mean, there's some, you know, there's so many people out there that are so inspirational that if you see them, so it's just like, you know, you you can uh, be a victim or you can be a victim in into being somebody who's actually going to be a leader and someone who's going to actually, you know, walk the walk. Right. Right. And You're going to let something hold you back from, you know, making a difference or doing something you want to do. Are you just exactly. Gonna and let that stop you? Exactly. We we all have one life, and we all have one short amount of time on Earth. 
that you you want to have any uh, regrets in life, and real yes. and think that I'm the type of person that anything that I do I give a hundred percent, and I'm either going to going to give my best trying or I'm going to die trying. And I know that sounds a little simplistic and maybe even a little stupid, <laughs> but that's always been my attitude that I'm going to give a hundred percent at whatever I do. And almost in that that line, I think it was Rocky three or four, where where Russian is saying, Drago is saying, if I if he dies, he's always been my attitude, you know. And I know it sounds kind of silly, but it's <clears throat> that's the that I go into things that I try to accomplish. If I it's nobody, not, nobody give me, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no one, no one to uh, basically tell me I can't do something. I've you know. I, give it my all and, and see what happens, see what the cards uh, fall. Like, it's, I, I said it's like a simplistic viewpoint, but really, like, nobody gets out alive. Like, what better option do you really have than to, you know, have the or die trying mindset? Exactly. You're you're going to die either way, you know, one day. like You're going to you die well either way it. at one point. You might as well see give it 100%. How yeah, and I'm not gonna lie and say there haven't been times that I haven't just exercised so hard that I've just kind of collapsed or I've had a mental breakdown or whatever. But you know, you, you know, mindset's always been you know, sit down, get a glass of water, and and just get up and deal with it. You know, the, get some rest. That's mm -hmm. that's probably the biggest things after you have a stroke is just rest and recovery so that's why sleep is so essential and i tried to just get as much rest as i could during the early days you 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 don't know how much is enough at that like how much is, is like you're recovering no, from a lot you really don't so i would sleep at night and then the, it was for me to take a nap for an hour or two during the day because i'm just not used to it mm. but you gotta recover i i think you you brought up something interesting that i don't know that i've ever considered because mm. i've only like seen and read about you know folks having strokes i'd never your vision th that seems something obvious now that you mentioned it but i don't think i've ever considered that that you be be able to see correctly yeah vision vision is a huge aspect i never realized to myself that when i had the stroke for six months i had double vision i had to wear special prism glasses just to see it was you know and it's i could begin to tell you you know the the how i felt or the the just you know it was just the double vision is awful the, and and um, like, uh, I kept, uh, you know, when I saw the the optometrist tell me, well, you most likely we'll give you six months and you should be fine to be able to drive. But I've spoken to uh, many people who've had strokes and they never got their vision back. So, you know, I feel kind of blessed that that, ha that it did happen. And I mean, even the that. even the paralysis on my left side with my arm, my leg. Many people who have the same thing that never fully recover. And I mean, I'm not. I'm not saying I'm a hundred percent, but I'm a, I'm I'm probably about eighty percent recovered. I'm never going to be a hundred percent, but you know, if I can get that extra ten percent to get up to ninety percent, I'll be pretty darn happy. Right. And that's that's something that I think we all have to give ourselves credit for. I used to, before any of this, I used to have a perfectionist mindset that, you know, things had to be done a certain way. And I think after the stroke, I realized that, you know, that's got to go out the, out the door. It's, you know, things might not be 100%, maybe there might be 90%, maybe there might be 80%, maybe there might be a little bit less, but it is what it is. As long as I'm giving my best effort, that's all that really that really matters you survived and, and that's a great start like that's, yeah look how far you've I, come yeah explain a little bit of, about us too that your your stroke wasn't like from lack of being in in good health it was uh, you said it was a condition you were born with 
Yeah, it was, uh, it's called the cavernoma. It's something, it's, it's basically a benign brain tumor. So it's non, non-cancerous, but it's a benign brain tumor that you're born with. And I never knew I had it. Never knew I had it. The only way you can act, actually ever see that you have it is if you ever had an MRI, which I never had. So I was perfectly, perfectly healthy. And I just, I come grocery shopping one day and I just collapsed. That's and I mean, I, I started, I started vomiting and, and just my head was spinning and I, I didn't know what was going on. They took, took one hospital, which is, is close. Then they, they couldn't tell what was wrong. So then they, put me in the ambulance, took me to another hospital. And it's, it's scary because, you know, the, 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 you know, wondering what's going on. And, you know, this one, one, uh, when I went to the first hospital, they told me, well, there's a mass that's in your, your brain. And, you know, they, they freak out, you know, what's, what's going on here. Right. You know, and, and it, you it wasn't, all... yeah, that, that time in the hospital was the worst. Anyone who's ever been in the hospital, it's like you're exhausted from the stroke. And every hour on the hour, they're checking your vitals. It's all, you can't get any rest. Yeah. There's no rest. Yeah. All, all I needed was rest. And these people weren't giving me any rest. It's just constant, you know, what are your vitals? And I understand they had their job to do, but it's just like... All I wanted to do was rest, and my head was was. You begin to imagine, you know, I'm 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 pain that I can deal with a lot of pain, but the the pain in my head was just like you you can't even describe it. It's like somebody yeah. took a sledgehammer to your head. That's crazy. Well, I'm sorry that you had to go through that, but um... no, thank you. All right. Um, it is crazy to me how even when it is just rest that you're needing, they're constantly like in there, in your face, waking you up in the middle of your sleep, check your vitals, take your blood work, um, pee in this cup, let me bring you for more tests. Yeah, exactly. It was just, all I want to do was rest. I got in the hospital. So I, I was in the hospital for, I think, three or four days. And then when I was dis- discharged, I had an appointment, appointment with with um, with uh, my neurologist, and basically it was it was a dark appointment. They basically told me the neurologist told me basically that my life appointment. was they basically told told my life was over. Basically, <clears throat> by you this know, point, they, they determined what what the cause of it was. They did with with the with the cavernoma, your brain just kind of bleeds sometimes. It it just for whatever reason it was probably stress. But but you know, they they basically like, you know, you might not get your vision back and, and you might not walk again, and you might not, not do this again or that again, you might not get you know your arm back and and basically at the appointment feeling I've never, never felt low in my life, you know, but it was just like, I had two choices at that point. I could just be a victim or I can just decide, screw what the doctor said. And that was probably one of the times in my life where I just realized that after that point, where I'm not going to listen to doctors, I'm going to be my own doctor. So, I was like, you you made the right call there. Yeah, I basically, I, I did own rehab. I took, I did the rehab that they had me do for like three months. And I never did it after that. I did my own rehab. No one knows me like I, I do. With a 30-minute rehab, you know, going to these rehab centers, you're not going to get better. You've got to push. You've got to really do, do things hours and hours and repetition. Because basically... Think, think of the stroke of take, taking your uh, cell phone and throwing it into a swimming pool. It's going to short circuit. And that's exactly what your brain does. So what you have to do is you have to build back those neural pathways through neuroplasticity. 
And that's what I had to do. It's, I can't begin to tell you how many, how many times it's not one time or a hundred times, or it's thousands and thousands of times to do something to get it right all over again. And, and there, I'll be honest with you, there are days that you don't want to do it. But it's like days like you said that at four o'clock in the morning, you don't want to get up, but you just do it because you know you have to. No one's going to do it for you. Yeah, that's exactly right. Just because you don't want to do it doesn't mean that you shouldn't. Exactly. All right. During your recovery, were there any specific moments or people that significantly influenced your path to healing? I think there were, there was a moment in particular where I was on outside and, and it was raining and I, I fell the grass and I'll be honest, I, I am getting a mouthful of dirt. And it's just like, I don't know if you've ever seen, uh, what was it, the, the Die Hard, uh, not the movie, the, uh, 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 what was that movie with, with, uh, with Mel Gibson, uh, Lethal Weapon. The first mm. Lethal Weapon, where the fight scene at the end of the movie, where Mel Gibson's fighting with that guy, and he, he, his head, the guy pushes his head in the water, and is trying to almost, almost drown him or something, you know. Right. That's the thing that I got, that it's just like I had them, this mouthful of dirt, and it's just like... This is like the lowest point in my life that, that I ever had. And it's just like I can either be the victim or I can can rise, be the phoenix rising from the ashes. And I think the other thing was I had two younger kids at the, at the time that my kids motivated me as well to get better. That's always good to have that. Sometimes. It was. But one, one of the things you realize is we all think we have a lot of friends. And I'll be the first to admit, I had a lot of friends. But after something like this, like this happens, this you realize is. that there's, you might have, you might know a lot of people. You might know a lot of people, but a lot of these people are fair weather friends. Yeah. They're there, they're, you know, when times are good or where you're, you know, you're buying the drinks or doing this or that or, you know, but when times are tough, they might say, oh, I feel bad for you or this or that. You never hear from them again. Right. You know, it's, and that it's was difficult to be. It's difficult to be friends with you mm -hmm. now when when you're through something and when you might need help. Oh, yeah, exactly. But you realize the number of true friends. If you have you the number of friends on one hand and you're, you're actually true friends. Yeah. And I think that's that's this really it made me realize that. You know, the type of person that if you're broken down at two o'clock in the morning or you're in jail or, or something happened, these people are going to be there for you. True friends. There's a lot of fake friends out there, but true friends. And I think, you know, the, the, the stroke made me realize that, you know, there's a lot of fake people out there. Oh, yes. Yeah. There it is. And I think it's, I'd rather have two very close friends who actually have my back and are honest than a million friends out there. 100% correct. Yeah, definitely. How did your, your health changes, sorry, how did your health challenges influence your philosophy? Like you talked a little bit about like the, it, it requires a lot of mental fortitude and, and you've kind of been building on that, that picture this whole time to, to rebuild that. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about that? I really had to uh, build up my men. I thought I was, was tough uh, mentally before all this, but I mean, I really realized that I still had work to do. So it, it you know, it really helped me to, to really realize that I've got to build up my mental strength. I thought I was tough mentally before, but I was weak. And I really, um, I think this really made me realize that I, I still have a lot of work to do. And I mean, okay. it's, you, it's kind of like what, what I said before, where every area of your life, you've got to really look at. So my, my mental uh, focus, I had to look at my, my, uh, 
my uh, lifting with weights I had to look at, my cardio I had to look at, my, my nutrition I had to look at, everything. And I'm, I don't want to discount the change in any way that you have like demonstrated that you have gone through, but it requires a lot of mental fortitude to be able to even recover, e even go through the change of getting to who you are now, but still had to require an immense amount of resolve beforehand. <clears throat> Most definitely. I, you've, you've got to, I think the main point of all this is you can either choose to be the victim or you can be the phoenix rising from the ashes. And I mean, you know, things, we, we're all faced with obstacles. And I think we all have a choice whether we're going to do things one way or whether, how we're going to react one way or we're going to react, react a, a different way. And I think at the end of the day, it all comes down to this. There's an old expression, life is 1% what happens to you in 95 uh, one percent what happens to you and 99 percent how you read what happens to you something like yeah. that it might be five yeah, percent what happens to you and 95 percent how you react to it and i think that's really that's really uh life in a nutshell yeah i agree especially because like there are so many people out there who they'll have something bad happen to them or go through something a hardship and they'll automatically just blame all of the bad stuff that happens to them afterwards on that. Oh. Like, so I lost my job and I am living on the street now because this happened to me. No, you're doing, you're doing that because you're it's, doing it. Exactly. You're, you're hundred percent correct, Ashley. And I think that's the victim mindset. And uh, you know, you see that all too often. I see people on, on Facebook, for example, I have friends I went to high school with, who constantly every week they complain about their job and they hate it and they've been there for like 30 years and it's just like you know they've been uh, doing this job since high school and it's just like if you hate your job that much wow. do something about it i just wanted to grab them and shake them and say stop complaining and do something about it i don't want to hear you anymore Right, you know, people just playing the victim, and I'm so tired of the victim. That that's one of the things I think that's that's changed for me is to, to to some extent I have empathy for people, more empathy for people who've gone through difficulty, but less empathy for people that complain and do right nothing about it. Right, exactly. They're like a wet blanket. I have no right. empathy for people that that just play the victim all the time we no. all have we all there's not a person i know that hasn't gone through some type of adversity and yeah mine might be different from the next person but we all have had difficult times at one point or another in our life and it's how you choose to react to that which makes all the difference in the world that's why honestly even with my fitness I it's on cruise control for me now. I know how I know my body so much better than I ever used to. I know my diet, my training, everything. I know my, when, how much sleep I have to get. I know things. This has helped me realize my body more than I ever have. And I'm on cruise control now. I'm in shape, you know, you know, throughout the whole year. I'm in, I'm in you know, above average shape. I'm in better shape now than I was pre-stroke. It's amazing. And I think part of it, part of it is, is realizing how important health is. And the other part is, it's forced me to really dissect every aspect of my, my physical health and realize what works and what doesn't work. You know, all these people focus on, well, keto is the only way to lose weight or carnivore or all this other garbage. They all get you to the same point. They might, some might be a little more effective than others, but they all get you to the same point. These, these people that are like, well, oh, you can't eat carbs, or you can't do this or that, or there's only way to do this, this type of 
this exercise, or if you want to build abs, there's only this type of movement. It's all just a bunch of garbage. And I think that's one of the things that irritates me so much about trainers sometimes is there's a certain percentage of them that just, they're not about helping people get, get themselves in better shape. They're about just what worked for them and, and making money. And it's so much more than that. So much more than that. And I think that, uh, you know, the element of people that just, you know, yet what they did for their abs, for example, might have helped them get abs, but there's more than one way to get abs. And abs at the end of the day, they're giving these, you know, I see these stupid videos online, these, well, do these these three ab exercises. (laughs) 90% of abs, you know, at least 80 or 90% of abs, it's all about nutrition. Has nothing to do at all with these stupid ab exercises. I can have abs without even even doing any ab exercise. And I think that's one of the things that bothers me is when I see in the fitness in the industry with all this pushing of supplements and all this other crap, to be honest, I don't take any supplements. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't have to. And I mean, I view it as fitness is about 70% nutrition, about 25% of um, you know, the physical training with weights and about 5% supplements. But I mean, if you see some of these people online, they're, they're practically like, like 90% of everything is, is supplements. They'll have people that, you know, they're, they're advocating, you know, use my coupon code and spend hundreds of dollars a month on supplements. Yeah. Supplements aren't going to get you a good body. You know, I, I mean, I, I don't disagree with you at, at all, but I, I think, and I, I, I know the, exp- the the exact group of folks you're you're referencing because they they do make money off of the affiliate supplement. And I, I mean, I, I'm not trying to, you know, I think I'm just opinionated well, sometimes of my my no, no, what I say sometimes, you know. I, I don't mean disrespect to anyone. If like you and I talked about, if someone wants to use tea or steroids right. or whatever. That's their business. I think a lot of it stems from like the 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 trainers see a lot of people's diets. They see a lot of that, and they see how much yeah. is missing out of the that, yeah. that they need. Now, whether or not they recommend the the right thing to fill in those gaps, or whether they just you know make a profit on it, is that that's yeah pro- probably more. But yeah, I agree a hundred percent that it's at least. 60 or 70 percent nutrition to, to getting in shape. I, I think I think the biggest thing with supplements are like you mentioned, they're meant to supplement what you're missing in your diet. So yes, if you're missing certain things in your diet, take them. Don't go overboard. But just don't overboard. I mean, I see yeah, you don't need in my mind, you know, I don't take pre-workouts. I'm not gonna gonna take uh you know you know they have you take uh these pills to help digest carbs better all this garbage out there there's it's just you know you might need you know a a few supplements out there for certain vitamins and stuff but that's about it a a multivitamin that's that's a great place to start that's yeah it's a great place to start i i stand by that magnesium and potassium about the potassium Maybe vitamin D three with K two, um, yeah. you know something like that. Like that zinc, zinc is good for yes t- testosterone, ashwagandha. Maybe That's... you know. Yeah, there's there's somebody in my family who has gone way overboard with the pill taking. She takes like millions of supplements and pills in general, ones that she doesn't need, but she constantly she's a hypochondriac is that what it's called yeah yeah exactly um, and, and and actually you reach a point where it's like you don't even know what's working what's not working yes right. i i occasionally i'll like run out of stuff certain ones now like i i look more with magnesium that's why i take it that's bottom line and i'll be all i can do and reach mus- muscle failure more quickly if i take that and i also yeah. have a little bit more energy i feel like 
but yeah, I take it for a while. And then if I run out, you know, I, I'm not super good about making sure that I, I never run out, but I take it for a little while to see if I notice a difference. If I don't, then why don't we keep spending money on it? Exactly. And yeah. that's, that's, that's something, that's a good point. That's, okay. Uh, we, on, we only got a couple more questions left. I think uh, I asked the last one. Ashley, you're up. I covered a lot of the, the questions just, just via discussion, so I didn't want to sure. keep harping on them. Um, yeah, and I'm sorry. I ramble sometimes. So I'm oh, sorry. no, you're good. No, it's, Thanks I'd for prefer, your show. Yeah, that's, that's what we're here. The discussion is a way better, you know, method of storytelling and, and mechanic getting getting your message out. And that's what we want to do here tonight. And um, we both ramble all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's half the show. That's, <laughs> then, then we're even then. Okay, well, I'll, I'll ask one and then Ashley, you can ask one. And I, I think that's, I think we've covered about everything else. Uh, your story is, is a source of inspiration for sure. That was the, the main reason that I wanted you on the show is, is I wanted people to hear your story because it's, it's incredible. And, and people have done so much less in their life and been, have been, been given so much more and, and not to throw it into a religious discussion, but you know, whom, who much is given much is expected. But I, I, I just see so many people do to so, so, or yeah, so much less with, with given more, like you say, and they mm -hmm. complain. And as of recent, like I got, I, I've reached a point too, where I'm, I'm tired of seeing the same people from, from high school complaining about this, that, and the third, and they're not making any changes at all. Exactly. To, and, and you can't complain about it if you're if you're doing everything in your power and there's nothing you can do you know okay all right you know this sucks you know but it is what it is but i've just gotten comfortable i don't care if they've been a friend since high school how often do i what you said are they going to be there for me are they going to speak at my funeral no okay i don't need yeah. them on my on my facebook i don't need them on my social media just exactly. to see i'm i'm trying to get better in 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 all the ways that i'm trying to you you the same and it, I, I just don't think it's healthy to keep up with them. It's a drain, if anything. Um, yeah, I, but I think I think one thing, um, one point mm -hmm. I wanted to make is, if you kind of want to see what your futures, take the average of, of maybe your, your your friends, maybe five or ten of your friends, average all of them. So maybe some friends are fives and some are eights and some are sixes. Average them all up. That's going to be your future. So if you want your future to be better, you got to be hanging around the right people. That's so. I mean, I'd be the first to admit I can count the number of, of people I, I that are friends or people I hang around with on one hand. It used to be multiple hands I used to count people on, but it's just like there's so many phonies out there and fakes. The more and part of it is too when you start up like your family and you kind of like. Do I really want those people in my family? They're friends and all, but are they kind of, you know, people that I want integrating with my family? Is that? They're, they're exactly what I call fair weather friends. They're yeah. there for you when times are good, but when times are get tough, they don't want to hear, you'll never hear, you'll never hear from them again. I, I agree with that. And one of the, we actually did a podcast on that involving family and friends, people who have, done so much to you in your life or just aren't actually your friend and are just fake in your life and are just trying to exactly you with them there's so many fake people out there that's that's why it's important when you find a, a true <clears throat> friend uh to nurture that uh relationship i agree it's yes. and it's hard to know because you still have to you meet someone new you kind of have to nurture it for a while before you see their actions and see if they line up with what they're saying or not. So it, it's a gamble kind of at the end of the day, no matter what. It's hard sometimes. And I think we've all had experiences where people of uh, that we thought were really good friends have stabbed us in the back at some point or another. Oh, definitely. But that's the size of it. That's su such as life. Yes. Uh, and so, it might hurt, but sometimes it's like you need to get them out of your life. Exactly. Yeah. So <clears throat> your your story is is inspirational, and and that's why I wanted you here on the show today. What 
message do you want to share with those who are facing their own health or, or mental health challenges? Uh, basically, never give up. Always realize that um, you can do more than you give yourself credit credit for. And, and you can accomplish so much if you put your, your mind and your heart and your soul into it than you really thought that, that, that you could before. There's been so many things that I've faced that I thought, I'm never going to be able to do this. And I, I think back that, you know, when this first happened, I could be in a completely different reality right now if I just gave in and felt sorry for myself and played the victim versus where I am today. And I'm not perfect, but I'm steps ahead of what I would have been if I just played the victim. So I think my message is to never give up, never surrender, and never think that, you know, you can't accomplish something. It might not be as good as other people as you were before this happened, but you can still achieve much more than, than uh, you know, you might give yourself credit for that you can really do if you put your mind, your body, and your soul into it. It comes down to just determination, willpower, and want, wanting to really make the best out of your lot in life because we all have issues we have to face but it's, you know, I think for me, part of the thing was, what is my legacy? What are my kids going to think about me? What are my parents going to think about me? Are they going to look at me as a failure or are they going to look at me as a winner? Yeah, I think the, go ahead. I have one, one other kind of question. Well, two sort of one question before Ashley takes the last one, but... <clears throat> I don't like using the word happy. I don't like throwing around like, are you happy now that, you know, you're doing something that you find find meaningful? And that's kind of a fair question, but is what you're doing now more fulfilling to you than than before you had the stroke? I would say yes, because really what's really made me realize is the stroke really, I don't want to be sound corny when I say this, but it was almost like a blessing in, in disguise when I say it, because it, it really helped me realize that life is precious and we all take things for granted. And I was no different. You know, you take, like I said before, your vision, the ability to walk, the ability to talk, all these different things we take for granted. And I think that the stroke really caused me to realize, it gave me a wake-up call to realize that perspective. And I, I look sometimes at people that that are able to do things that I'm not able to do, and I'm like, you know, they're not appreciative of what they have and what they can do. They just take it for granted. But, I mean, you know, you've got to reach a point where I think so. It's given me perspective to realize that life is precious. And I think that I think I value time and I value, to be honest, waking up every morning. I never used to think of that. And now I wake up every morning. I'm like, I'm thankful to be alive. So I think it's, it's made me realize that I've got a lot to be thankful for. I'm not, I might not be where I'm at, but I never took my life, uh, you know, I never took it as serious as I could have. Now I don't take it for granted, anything that I do. Right. Yeah, I think that's a very important lesson for everybody too as well. Not many people know, you know, like you said, not many people what realize what they have until it's gone. Exactly. And I think that that was a song too. <laughs> but I think that uh, you really don't realize what you have until you've lost it. And I think that, we all just, we all, you know, in this world we live in, that's one thing I hate about the internet, that when I was growing up, we didn't, you know, we had like three or four, and I'm dating myself here, but we had like, you know, 10 or less channels on the TV. There was no cable, you know, uh, used to go outside and play. Now there's all these video games and people take things so much for granted if they don't have this or that. And it's just like you realize 
they might not have the power for a few hours and they're all complaining and life sucks and, or, or the internet's down for a little bit and they're all complaining. And it's just like, appreciate what you have, not what you don't have. Yeah. I mean, when, when you think about it from like how, how little you need to survive food, water, you know, you know, clean facilities for restroom, like how, how much more do you need? Exactly. That's a very good point. And I think we live in such a society that's material, uh, materialistic and so much focused on, on, you know, physical possessions. And there's so many more things that are, are important than that. Okay. And I mean, all that stuff is ir irrelevant when you look at your physical health. Like I said before, you can have all the money you want in the bank. If you don't have your physical health, you have nothing. Right. And at the end of the day, once you die, where's that stuff going to go? Yeah, where is it going to go? Yeah, you're, yeah, you're not going to run your cough and put all the money. It's not going to be there, you know? So I think I used to, when I was younger, I used to work in a nursing home for a few years, you know, um, and, and you see people in there and it's just like you feel you feel bad for them because sometimes some of the families just drop these people off there. And I get to some extent that uh, some of the folks, their physical issues used to be are more than the family can handle, but there are other people that the family just didn't want to deal with them. But, but I think the thing that I realized was all these, almost every person I ever came across, they all had regrets in life. I wish I did this. I wish I asked that girl out, or I wish, you know, I exercised more. I wish I took better care of my health. I wish I did this or that. Why not do it now? And I think, I think the stroke really made me realize that, you know, there might not be a tomorrow. And what am I, what am I doing to make today better? And that's one of the things I try to impart on the people that I coach how can I make their life better? And I'll be the first to admit, that's why I'm, I'm looking at coaching as more of a whole, whole, holistic kind of thing, mind, body, spirit. But physical health with coaching and getting your, your body in shape, your mind in shape, and getting your health in shape, losing any extra weight you have, that's the foundation. That's like the foundation the house is built on. If you don't have that, you don't have anything. Yeah, I agree. And yeah, it's one of those things. Why, why live your life with regrets? Always wondering what if. What if, exactly. Um, for our final question <laughs> of the night, uh, how can our listeners connect with you and learn more about your training programs? I think... The best way to do that, I usually post on TikTok, usually every day. Uh, there's a link in my TikTok to get to uh, Instagram, which has a link to my coaching program where you fill out a form and then I contact you. So I think the best way to do it is to do that. Get on TikTok, see my videos. But you see from my videos, as, as you had mentioned before, they're mixed. Some are about fitness, some are about, about mindset, some are about all different things. Perfect. It's, That's what you want. That's And, and that, I think fit, fit men over 40. Is yeah. David's it's kind handle. of a mind, it's kind of a mind, body, spirit. And, you know, I mean, there's been videos, if you look back, I talk about, you know, if you're losing your hair, what do you do about it? You, you have an issue uh, with, with something else. What do you do about it? You have an issue with your testosterone. What do you do about it? Yeah, that's definitely very helpful. I think that's a good thing to have out there because many people, they don't actually know what to do if something happens. They just go Ex about Exactly. And I think that's when, when something that, that I've always, something I'm, I'm noticing that, you know, <clears throat> I have an, a health issue you know, I focus my effort on how can I solve this problem? That's been a big thing with my stroke. I did so much uh, research that I knew as much, if not more, than a lot of these doctors knew about, about something. 
And I mean, that's not trying to pat myself on the back, but I think all of us, if we put our mind to something, you can, you can become like an expert practically on something. That's, there's a great divide slash debate in the trainer community of, of like, do trainers know more than doctors? Some is like, yes, some cases. Yeah, they they're do. in some cases. Kind of, it, yeah. It's like you said, the, the one trick pony fitness Instagram influencers. And the, these doctors sometimes telling you, you need to lose weight or you, these people need to lose weight or they need to do this, 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 this or that. They're overweight themselves. And they're yeah. giving advice. They're giving advice. Or they're telling you how to do certain things. And, and you know, I, I, I laugh. I, I get my yearly physical, but, you know, I mean, you've got to, to some extent, be your own doctor. Yeah. But a lot of people just don't pay attention to themselves or their health or they they take it for granted and and exactly and i i think i think this stroke has really made me realize that i know my body better than i ever have in my life i know aches pains how i'm feeling what that means i never knew that before as much it really snaps you into place and makes you like research find out all the information you can because you're you want to know and you want to be able to help yourself well, at the end of the day the doctor's not going to it's not his life you know he's not going to be the one that does or doesn't walk whether, whether oh exactly the that's it 100 percent. and and you might have these doctors for what is it a, a 15 minute or 20 minute appointment they're, they're not living your life honestly you see nurses more than you do doctors anyway oh yeah exactly and doctors, I find, all they want to do is give you medication. Yeah. And medication isn't, it's not going to cure you. It's just going to going to give you temporary a relief of the issue. That's no all it's going to do. No one ever actually fine. looks at, like, there's so many side effects to the medication. And there's so many side effects. Even, so as, even aspirin. There's so many side effects to all of that. Right. So it's just like you're you're making yourself worse by taking the medication that they're giving you because oh you're yeah trying doctors to... were, were trying to give me all this medication take this for your head and that for, for this and that and it's just i don't take any of it it's for what to have more more uh side effects yeah <clears throat> to make the uphill battle worse and take longer exactly and then potentially they're offering all these pain medications. I saw in the health field how easy it is for people to get addicted to medication. I didn't want to do that. It well, really is. David... Sorry, oh. go ahead. I was just going to say that's uh, a lot of them like will warn you, oh, uh, I'm only giving them until this day. Yeah. But then you, they'll give you a prescription to renew it. And it's like, no, don't do it. It's my my mindset is I don't even want it to begin with. I'd rather not deal with it and just, you know, handle it on my own than become uh, addicted to pills because I, I could I saw what drugs did to people that I used to work with, you know, at you know, at my job. You know, it's a shame. It's a real shame. It really is. David and, and oh sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, um, really, what I, what I used to find working in mental health was people that would take drugs and stuff, it was just to treat mental health issues. And I think that was a point that you made before, that mental health issues are swept under the rug. Pills are just something that, that the average person uses to just cope with these issues, whether, think... it's, alcohol, whether it's alcohol or pills or drugs or Prozac whatever or any of it <clears throat> there is a there is something to be said for if you if you are like on the edge and borderline suicidal like tied depressants with oh, sure. therapy like you know you you might need a little buffer while pill. you're trying to 
while you're trying to unbox things. But yes, it's you're not more about than them. just take pills. I said a, a buffer. It's a temporary buffer. They're not going to get you there. If you if you just yeah, taking no. pills and doing nothing, the next year you're going to be in the same place, just taking more exactly. Pills. I'm sorry. I was more talking about the the, the hardcore drugs. We, we oh, would have that people. <clears throat> I view them the as in the same drug. light. View them in the same light simply for the the kind of, kind of what you said about the mental health aspect. Like, I mean, people are still still, and, and this is my two cents, but they're still taking a substance to cope yeah. with whatever the problem is that they're facing, whether it's Percocet or Prozac or or alcohol or or any of it. If they are not actively working towards the boxing, perfect example. Like, okay, like for for. Getting off of medication, off of, of heroin, you know, okay, or other opiates, like, okay, but that is a, a temporary, then you taper it while you're in therapy, and then you get to the root of why, why are you taking this, something this heavy in the first place? Okay. It, it's all got to be unboxed, and if you don't, then it's not going to get any better. Right. And they start getting it into their heads like, oh, I have to take this. I, I can't not take it. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's about all the time we have. Uh, David, it's been it's been awesome to have you uh, here on the show with us. I I also like to say uh, at Fit Men Over 40 is uh, David's TikTok Instagram or um, TikTok handle. His Instagram is fit underscore men underscore over underscore 40 i think i got that correct and he is phoenix fitness so thank you very much for having me thank you thank we, you for coming. We enjoyed having you yes all the best uh in the new year to uh both of you you as well thank you, you as well david yes, yes.